DiscerningHearts.com presents Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher. This series of programs is a special presentation of the retreat conducted by Father Timothy Gallagher, which features the lives of St. Therese of Lisieux, Saints Louis and Zelle Martin, servant of God Leone Martin, and the entire Martin family. We now begin Conference 4. Let's say the, um, the prayer for the family, and you have the image of uh, Celie and Louis there. One of you mentioned this just before we started, so let's pray this for all of our families. Father in heaven, you called Saints Louis and Celie Martin to holiness, to their married life. You gave them as mother and father to Saint Therese of Lisieux. Through their intercession, we ask you to bless the married couples of our diocese and those who are preparing for marriage. Bless our children and our grandchildren. Guide us by your Holy Spirit to bear witness in our lives to the beauty of the sacrament of marriage. Guide us as citizens the kinds of decisions that will support family life and respect the dignity of children. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saints Louis and Celie, pray for us. Saint Therese, servant of God, Leonie, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the first time that uh, I've said in public a prayer to those two saints, probably the first time for many of us. And it's a wonderful thing. I bet you'll find what I find, that as you get closer to these uh, different persons, you'll find yourself turning to them and praying to them. And I'll just add my own little bit that when I turn to Leonie, things seem to happen. Uh, I think she's really worth turning to. All right, we're on page, let's see, page 21 in the book. And uh, this is the letter of March 30th, 1873. So this is written pretty close to that last letter that we finished with uh, this in our last meeting where um, Therese comes to such a, a, a point of peril and then comes through it. <clears throat> One of us in the group commented on the fact that Zelie turns to St. Joseph in her time of desperate need here. And I'll just remark that when she has the two boys, they're both called Joseph, and obviously with reference to St. Joseph. So she writes now to her sister-in-law, my dear sister, so this is uh, what has happened is that uh, Isidore, her brother, has the pharmacy that we've talked about. And at recently, he has acquired a building across from the square. This is right in the center of Lisieux. And he is starting there a wholesale drug business as well. And he has just gotten this set up when a fire destroys the building. And Zeli has just learned about this, and so she's writing. My dear sister, I, I, he would reestablish the business later on. My dear sister, I'm sorry to hear of the fire you told me about. So that's what I've just explained. When I think of all the trouble my brother went through to organize his drug business and in an instant to see all his efforts lost. So no hands raised, but have any of us ever found ourselves in that situation where we worked very hard and gotten something set up and then it falls apart on us. And how do you live that? When I think of all the trouble my brother went through to organize his drug business and in an instant to see all his efforts lost, one must have a great deal of faith and resignation to accept this setback without complaint and with submission to God's will. As for me, I feel the consequences of this misfortune that's that other-centeredness. It's always there. This, joined with the tribulations I already have, has taken away my courage. I just wrote a letter to my little girls. That's uh, Marie and Pauline, who are at the visitation school. 
I just wrote a letter to my little girls that is hardly going to delight them. I just spoke to them about your disaster and the troubles of this world. It's true that each person has a cross to bear, but there are some for whom it is heavier than others. And it's hard not to understand that she's thinking of what she's living through right now. The peril of Therese, her youngest, then her brother's misfortune right now. Uh, you can add her own health. She's not speaking about it, but that's an ongoing issue. And all the many concerns, Leonie, just the many concerns of her life. My dear sister, you've already begun to see that life is not a bed of roses. God wills this to detach us from the world and raise our thoughts to heaven. What is it that uh, St. Um, or not St. C.S. Lewis says that God speaks to us in our joys, but shouts to us in our sorrows. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. Um, that's kind of what she's, uh, what she's saying here. And when we've been in situations like this in our own lives, where things are stripped away from us, or uh, there are problems of health or finance or family members and so forth, um, we would find ourselves echoing what, what Zaylee says here. <clears throat> But this is always in her. I, I keep emphasizing this. You will always see the turn toward heaven. Heaven is the place where all of this will be over. And it's not far away. Yes, so um, she's walking that road. Interestingly, the doctor goes with her, apparently walking the road with her uh, those six miles to see her, uh, Therese. Yesterday, while going with the doctor to see my little Therese, Maybe the doctor had a carriage. You know, it's hard to imagine a doctor doing this kind of walk. Uh, yesterday, while going with the doctor to see my little Therese, who is very sick, I noticed a beautiful chateau and some magnificent properties. So she's comparing that with what she's living. I said to myself that all of that is nothing. We'll only be happy when all of us, we and our children, are reunited in heaven. And I offered up my child to God. I will say, one of you asked me yesterday just how this story impacts me. And one, one of the things that it does, and I'm really grateful for, uh, both of my parents are deceased. I have no doubt knowing how they lived with the Lord. And on the wall of my room, I have a picture. I remember when it was taken. They were in their 40s at the time. And they're seated on, on a, um, it's a kind of a bench in our living room. And it's just a lovely picture of the two of them seated side by side. And I have that on the wall of my room, framed and on the wall. And before I do anything, I'm always turned to them, even just to leave my room to go, I don't know, to the pharmacy or something. Certainly when I set off on a trip like this or anything of significance, and I'm grateful to this story because it has made this come more alive for me. There really is a communion of saints. And we really can commune with each other in that communion of saints. And to think of the day when, you know, all, all of us have loved ones whom we miss. And we all know, and I'll just speak of parents, but uh, those who are themselves parents will see this in other ways. We never stop missing the people that we love. Life goes on, but we never stop missing them. And this is the answer, really, uh, this perspective that Celie and Louis and all of the Martin sisters have so profoundly is to await the moment when we'll all be together again. And if we want to be biblical about it, when every tear will be wiped away and all of these sufferings uh, will be in the past. And that's, that's very, very close to Celie's heart, as you can see. We'll only be happy when all of us, we and our children, are reunited in heaven and I offered up my child to God. The next is five weeks later, and it's uh, Zelie writing to Pauline, who is at the visitation. And the reason why she's writing to Pauline and not to both Marie and Pauline is because Marie is at home very ill with typhoid. And she had a pretty severe case of this, and she didn't get over it quickly. So uh, Zelie is writing to Pauline, who is 12 years old at this time, to let her know how things are going. This is a little early, but this is the beginning of a, uh, an extensive series of letters that Zelie will write to Pauline. I think I've mentioned earlier that 
uh, Pauline became kind of her confidant, uh, the one with whom she could speak openly, and especially as Pauline be became 14, 15, and 16, so on, which is pretty much uh, approaching adult age in the culture of, of the time. My dear Pauline, I don't have good news to tell you. Marie is not at all better. She's battling with typhoid. We're all sorry to see this, that this illness continues to go on like this. If you ever read the letters, you can get many more details uh, on this illness and what happens. Now, Therese, Marie wants me to tell you that little Therese came to see us yesterday. So we're still in that first 13 months when Therese is with Rose in uh, Semaye. But what happens is that Rose comes into town every Thursday and she brings some of the produce of their farm and there's a market and she sells it. So once a week on Thursday, she comes in and what she does is to bring Therese with her and leave her with Zelie and the family, but it doesn't go all that easily. We weren't expecting her. The wet nurse, that's Rose, arrived with her four children at 1130, just as we were sitting down to the table at, at the table. She put the baby in our arms and left immediately for mass, which tells you something about Rose as well. Yes, but the little one didn't want this. She cried almost to the point of passing out. Her father left almost without eating. He just can't bear it, you know, what, what's happening. The entire house was in disarray. I had to send Louise, that's the maid, to tell the wet nurse, so she goes to the church where uh, Rose is attending mass, to tell the wet nurse to come immediately after the mass because she was supposed to go buy shoes for her children. So that's the plan. Rose is gonna to go to the noon mass, then she'll do the shopping that she needs to do. But it, it's evident that they really need, Therese really needs her present. So she, uh, Zelie sends Louise the maid to Rose who is in the midst of the mass uh, to tell her when the mass is over, please come if you can immediately. But Rose comes immediately. She doesn't even wait for the mass to end. And now I, I've, I've touched on this but this, this is where we're going to, where we can, you can really see the, the separation. Um, I think the psychologists would call this separation anxiety. Would that be the proper term for it? Um, so she begins to bond with her mother, Zaylee, but Zaylee is unable to nourish her in the way that she needs. So at two months, Therese is taken away from the family to live with Rose's family six miles away. And what happens is Therese, and we'll see it in the letters, Therese now bonds with her second mother, if we can call her that. And she absorbs the country way of living and the style of dress and so on, becomes uh, habituated with this. So that when she is brought back to the family home, where there's lace making and wealthy clients coming and, and it is a completely different environment, and she's just filled with fear and she just cries. She just wants Rose in the way that a child would want its mother. And you can follow this through because uh, at 13 months, she's going to go through this again when she leaves Rose and so forth, as, as we've said in the story. So that's what we're getting here in what happens. Imagine how painful this is for a mother. You know, that her, her own child uh, of just some months is just terrified to be with her and the family. The wet nurse uh, left halfway through the mass, so she doesn't wait for the mass to end. We only know a little bit about her, but I like everything I see about this woman. Um, left halfway through the mass and came running. I was annoyed over this. In other words, you should have stayed for the end of mass. It's like her scolding her sister-in-law for sending all these gifts, you know. She wasn't gonna die. You could have stayed there for the mass. The little one wouldn't have died from crying. Oh, well, she was instantly consoled. As soon as Rose comes back, all the crying is over and Therese is happy. She's very strong and everybody's surprised. I walked her and shook her so much to make her stop crying that I got a backache from it that lasted the entire day. We don't find her as beautiful as little Celine. She is, however, very pretty. In other words, it's Celine who, for the moment, has the first prize for beauty. We can't judge Therese yet. She's too little, 
a tiny baby of four months hasn't blossomed. Three weeks later to Pauline. A week from Monday will go by carriage. Okay, so they did go by carriage that sometimes. Well, it's because the whole family is going to go, the whole group. We'll go by carriage to see little Therese. She's very strong now. I saw her last Thursday, her wet nurse. And so this is not the same Thursday that we just read about, but another because this is three weeks later. Um, her wet nurse brought her, but she no longer wants to stay with us. She let out piercing screams when she didn't see the wet nurse anymore. So Louise, the maid, had to take her to the market where little Rose was selling her butter. There was no other way of handling it. As soon as she saw her wet nurse, she looked at her and started laughing. Then she didn't breathe another word. She stayed like that, selling butter with all the good women until noon. As for me, I can't hold her for a very long time without getting very, for a long time without getting very tired. She weighs 14 pounds. She'll be very good and even very pretty later on. And here is Louise, the traveler, setting off on a pilgrimage. Your father leaves Tuesday on a pilgrimage to Chartres, which is not too far away from um, Alençon. But these pilgrimages were done on foot, and it'd be a few days of walking. And uh, this particular pilgrimage, about 20,000 pilgrims, pilgrims went on it because after the war, they had just been through and all the hostility toward the church. This was uh, a pilgrimage to ask Our Lady to bring peace and uh, a happier situation for the church. We probably don't have enough pilgrimages, you know, in our lives. Um, this is a stray thought, but when I was um, writing one of the books, I was hosted by the Jesuit community at the Regis College in Toronto. So I was living with them at an office on the campus and I would work on the writing and usually by mid afternoon or so I had done all the creative work that I could do. And so I would, I would take a walk. And after a while it occurred to me, well, why don't you make it a pilgrimage? So I would choose one of the churches and, you know, and head off, got my exercise, but it was a very nice thing. You know, it's different just to take a walk or to have some, um, some goal of that kind. You need to pray for a few minutes in the church and then come on home. Maybe we need in our current circumstances to do what these French Catholics were doing or a little bit more of it, you know? Uh, let's see. So, okay. Uh, where are we here with the pilgrimage? Okay. Um, he won't be back until Wednesday during the night. So that's a two-day pilgrimage. Goodbye, my dear Pauline. I hug you with all my heart. Six weeks later, again to Pauline. My dear little Pauline, and this time it goes well. Thursday, the wet nurse brought little Therese. She did nothing but laugh. She especially liked little Celine. And as I said, this would be a lifelong thing. Who made her scream with laughter. You could say she already wants to play. That will come soon. She holds herself up on her little legs, stiff as a post. And I think she's going to start walking early. If you've read the story of the soul, you know that uh, early on in it, Therese quotes a number of these letters of, from her mother to Pauline. Pauline saved them. You know, we're really blessed that the Pauline, uh, that the family, they were, they saved these, uh, these letters. It's the one reason we have them. And when Pauline asked Therese to write the story of the soul, and she gave her some of these letters, which is why she quotes them in the story of the soul. But there are a lot of details about Therese in these first years that you don't get in the story of the soul. She doesn't quote all of the letters. Now she's eating well, and I assure you she finds my porridge good, exclamation point. I made a lot on Thursday, so little Celine could also have some, but Therese didn't think it was too much. All that was left was the part stuck to the pot. You must have been a good cook, I guess. We decided that we won't go to see her until next month when you're home. We don't want to have that pleasure without Pauline. I wouldn't be able to go so long without seeing the baby, but the wet nurse brings her to me on Thursdays. Your father just told me to give you a big hug for him. He's leaving to go fishing, his favorite pastime. Goodbye, my Pauline. I also hug you with all my heart, your loving mother. 
three weeks later, to her sister-in-law. Celine is big for her age, but she's not strong. I'm always afraid that she'll fall ill like little Helene. So that's her real worry here. You know, Helene, who lives to be five. And uh, Celine is in her fifth year at this point. Tourette, you know, actually, Celine lived to be 90. Uh, Pauline also lived to be 90. Marie lived to be 80. And um, uh, Leonie to be 71. Of course, Therese died at an earlier age, at 24. But these four sisters lived full lives. Full lives. So Pauline dies in 1951, and uh, Celine dies in 1959. It's not that far removed. That overlaps with the lives of some of us here. You know, that includes me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but she's not strong. I'm always afraid she'll fall ill like little Helene. Therese is a big baby, tanned by the sun. Her wet nurse takes her into the fields, because she works in the fields on their farm, carrying her in a wheelbarrow on top of a load of grass. So you can see Therese getting thoroughly uh, habituated with the farming environment you know, and the life involved with that. Little Rose says that you could never see a cuter baby. So as you see, my dear sister, all is going well. It's nice to hear uh, Zaylee write this kind of thing. The beginning of the year was sad for me. That is that a serious illness that Therese has. But apparently the end of the year will be better. Now, the next letter is uh, of interest because I believe it's the only letter that we have from Zaylee to her husband, uh, Louis. And the reason why she's writing to him is that you can see this is August 31st. This is their summer vacation. She and Marie and Pauline have gone up to Lisieux and they're spending time with their cousins, Celine and the two girls, Jeanne and uh, Marie. And so she writes uh, to her husband from that situation. Obviously, he's still back at the family home in Alençon. We arrived yesterday afternoon. So she's writing uh, the first day she's there. Um, and you'll see in the letter, she says, if I get a chance, I'll write tomorrow as well. She just wants to stay in touch. We arrived yesterday afternoon at 4.30. My brother was waiting for us at the station and was delighted to see us. He and his wife are doing everything they can to entertain us. This evening, Sunday, there's a beautiful reception in their home in our honor. Tomorrow, Monday, we're going to Trouville, which is that resort on the sea. So it'll be a day trip. Tuesday, there will be a big dinner at the home of Madame Modelonde, who is the sister of their Aunt Celine and uh, her family. And perhaps a drive to the country house of Madame Fournay, who is Celine Guerin's mother, in uh, the saint ouen le pin is uh, a, a farmhouse that uh, Celine's mother had. And uh, if you read the story of a soul, you'll see Therese talk about the times that they went out there. And there's actually even a sketch that uh, Therese did of that house, which has been conserved. The children are thrilled, and if the weather were good, they'd be ecstatic. And now here's, here's a Zélie away from home, even in such a warm setting as this. As for me, I'm finding it hard to relax. None of that interests me, going to the sea, going out into the country. I'm absolutely like the fish you pull out of the water. I like that, you know. <laughs> that's, that's just a nice way to, to say it. Not like a fish out of water, but like the fish you pull out of the water. <laughs> They're no longer in their element, and they have to perish. This would, away from her family and her children and her home, this would have the same effect on me if I had to stay a lot longer. I feel uncomfortable, I'm out of sorts. This is affecting me physically and it's almost making me sick. However, I'm reasoning with myself and trying to gain the upper hand. I'm with you in spirit all day. And I say to myself, now he must be doing such and such a thing. And then look what she says here. And just imagine Louis reading this. I'm longing to be near you, my dear Louis, and he knows this. I love you with all my heart. 
And I feel my affection so much more when you're not here with me. It's always there, but when you're not here with me, I'm just so much more aware of the love I have for you. It would be impossible for me to live apart from you. This morning I attended three masses. So this is a Sunday and this is her Sunday, her way of living it. I went to the one at six o'clock, made my Thanksgiving and said my prayers during the seven o'clock mass and returned for the high mass. My brother is not unhappy with his business. It's going well enough. So the two children who are home, tell Leonie and Celine that I kiss them tenderly and will bring them a souvenir from these years. I'll try to write to you tomorrow if possible, but I don't know what time we'll be returning from Trueville. I'm hurrying because they are waiting for me to go visiting. We return Wednesday evening at 7.30. How long that seems to me. This is Sunday and they'll be returning us Wednesday evening. I kiss you with all my love. The little girls want me to tell you that they're very happy to have come to these you and they send you big hugs. Again, to her brother and sister-in-law two months later. This morning, I read, received your letter and it made me very happy. I've already read it many times because I always read your letters several times to make the pleasure last as long as I can. When I think of receiving letters, uh, when I entered the seminary, uh, I entered over in Italy. At that time, my community didn't have any houses in this country. And um, once a day, the mail would arrive. And there was a number of us, a number of Americans, you know, young men. And when the mail arrived every day, it was a big thing. You know, um, everybody hoped that they'd get a letter because that was, there was no, um, there were no computers, none, no internet, none of that uh, at that time, no, not even faxes yet. So it was either letter or that was the only way to communicate. And just how much that meant to us to get a letter like that. And Zeli is many, many more times, you know, feels that. I brought the children back to Le Mans, that's uh, Marie and Pauline, on the 8th of this month. And she's not yet able, Leonie has gone once. And as I think I mentioned, it was so disruptive that after two months, the sisters had to send her home. And uh, Zeli is, is, is hoping that she can make a second try because Zeli it feels helpless. Nothing she does is changing her daughter. She remains, all of the problems are there. And her single primary hope is that her sister, uh, Elise, Sister Marie Docité, and the gentleness and warmth, which, is, which are typical of the Salesian spirit of the visitation, will be able to work the change in her daughter. But what she says here, she, he, she can't yet send Leonie. Leonie still hasn't started school there yet. I pushed that back until the first of the year. It's the beginning, uh, it's the fall semester, but she's not ready. Let's hope that for the next semester she might be. If it weren't so important to me that her aunt prepare her for first communion, she'd never go to the visitation monastery. It just strikes me that uh, the ants on both sides play a very important role in the life of the family. They're almost um, on both sides. So Celine, you know, uh, her sister-in-law, and then on the other side of the family, uh, Sister Marie Docité. Uh, she'd never go, but I want to see if our sister manages to change her as I hope. Celine doesn't go to class. I'm teaching her to read myself. Again, the fear for her. She's such a delicate child that I have to keep her near me. In spite of all my care, I'm very afraid I won't be able to raise her. She's almost always burning with fever. She's a little girl who is turning out exactly like her little sister, Helene. Therese is doing very well. She's big and strong. She holds herself up leaning against the chairs, and I think she'll be walking by her first birthday. My husband went to Lourdes, so here's another uh, pilgrimage on a diocesan pilgrimage, and there's a funny thing here, and brought us back two little stones broken off from a rock a few meters from the grotto of the apparition. What happens is that Louis is at the grotto, if anyone's been to Lourdes, or we've all seen pictures of it, and uh, he notices a woman who is just a few feet away from the grotto, 
she has a hammer and she's tapping at the rock. She wants to get some little chips of rock. Well, here's, here's the watchmaker and the man who is so good with his hands. So he goes over to help her, takes the hammer and himself um, breaks off a few pieces for her. What happens is that other people there see this happening and immediately a whole flock of people come there and the security guard gets involved and he threatens to call the police and so on. But uh, Louis gets out of it without any trouble. But that's, that's, that's how those pieces of rock come to be in the story. When the pilgrims returned to Alençon, there was, now look at this, this is the hostility toward the church, which as I say, was not confined to words alone. So the people in Alençon know that a train is coming back with a, uh, carrying a pilgrimage of people who went to Lourdes and to Lourdes and they're there to receive them in their own way. When the pilgrims returned to Alençon, there was an enormous crowd around the station and all along the road. I was unable to go meet Louis and it was fortunate. One would have said I suspected what was going to happen. The travelers were all wearing the badges from the pilgrimage as you do when you're in a pilgrimage group. My husband left first with a little red cross attached to his chest. Several people heckled him and others laughed, but that was nothing compared to what happened next. When they saw most of the pilgrims wearing rosaries around their necks with beads as big as chestnuts, they insulted them in every way. And some of these hecklers were brought to the police station. However, they, the pilgrims, didn't return in a procession because the town council had forbidden it. Otherwise, they would have left the train and in procession gone back to their homes, but it was forbidden by the town authorities to do it. Uh, we also see Louis, I think we um, maybe um, uh, Chris, you may have mentioned this, that that uh, Louis would accompany the priest carrying communion through the streets and you would do this with a lighted candle. And he had no hesitation in doing this and they would get all the heckling you would expect. But uh, he simply disregarded all of that. He was never afraid publicly to show his faith uh, in such settings. All right, to uh, Marie and Pauline at the visitation school four days later. My dear little daughters, I haven't seen little Therese since the day we all went together to Semaye, and I miss her very much. And yet I have to make up my mind to go there, but it's very hard for me. It's so far away. It's that 10, 12 miles of walking involved every time. Fortunately, she won't have to stay there much longer. In fact, she would be there for five more months. My dear little daughters, I must go to Vespers, and I presume this is a Sunday. And in the parishes, they have Sunday Vespers, and Zaylee goes to this. And you have some charming things too, where Therese wants to go in the worst way, and then she falls asleep, and at one point says that the, the sermon was boring, and she hardly under, couldn't understand any of it, and so on. But it's all, all chronicled in the letters. My dear little daughters, I must go to Vespers to pray for the intention of our dear late relatives. That would be both of her parents and uh, Louis' father, all of whom are deceased at this point, perhaps others. There will come a day when you will go there for me, and I have to see that I won't have too much need of your prayers. And then look what follows here. I want to become a saint, and that won't be easy. And she did become a saint. I want to become a saint and that won't be easy. There's a lot of wood to chop and the wood is as hard as rock. It would have been better if I'd tried earlier while it was less difficult. Well, better late than never. Every one of us could write those words. There's no door that's closed. It's not ever too late. And that's what she's saying. All right, now she's writing to Isidore and again to his wife two months later. And now they do make a second attempt to have Leonie go to the visitation, visitation school as a boarder. <clears throat> Last Monday, I took the children back to, so you see the date, January 11. She does give the try now in the new year. I took the children back to the visitation monastery. Leonie was delighted to go. 
if she likes it there and they're able to educate her, I'll let her be a boarding student for a good many years. In fact, the other girls were there for many years. I can't give you the exact figure, but Marie was there something like seven to nine years and Pauline, something like that as well. Okay, now the next three letters that we have are written by Celie's older sister, Elise. Uh, and they give us a chance just to get a little taste uh, of Elise. And of course, she is at the visitation with Leonie there, and that's what she's going to be writing about. And the first letter is from her to her brother Isidore and his wife, Celine. So this is the 8th of February. Uh, Leonie has been there about a month at this point. Nearly all our children have got colds here, middle of winter, including Marie and Pauline, who have had bad ones and a temperature. They had to stay in bed for several days. Now they are better, although weak. Marie never fully recovered from her typhoid fever, even though she is not ill anymore. She isn't very well. Pauline is pale. Nobody in this little family is strong. But two of them live to be 90, one of them lived to be 80, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody in this little family is strong, not even their mother. Uh, a part is missing from the letter. This refers to Zelie here now. And it's uh, Elise's concern about her sister. Pains in her back and her chest and a cough all winter. If she isn't careful, she won't last long. It would, however, be a great loss to her family. I would have liked her to consult the doctor before this, before, uh, before beginning the Lenten fast she intends to do. Now, this is something that Zelie would never, she would never dispense herself from. She could have, I don't think there's any question, and that's what her sister, well, let's finish this and then I'll say what I have to say. Uh, let's see, I would have liked her to consult the doctor before beginning the Lenten fast she intends to do. Because even though many people dispense with this obligation too lightly, I believe that it would be prudent of her to ask the doctor for advice since he is a religious man and tr is trustworthy on this point. So this is before the changes of Vatican II. And the Lenten fast is not just Ash Wednesday and Good Friday as we have it now. It's every day of Lent. So it's a full 40 days of, of fasting. And uh, Zelie was very um, firm on this. She would never dispense herself from this. And what her sister is saying is that I really wish she had gone to talk to a doctor because with a medical dispensation, you could be dispensed from that. And Zaylee's health is what it is at this point. I'd say uh, if I were, you know, let's say if I were a confessor or a spiritual director and Zaylee came to me with this issue, I would probably en encourage her not to do the fast or to mitigate it in some way because her health was really what it was. And her sister who knows her health is concerned that the rigors of 40 days, which, and she won't do just the minimum, she's gonna do it thoroughly as she and Louis did with anything the church asked. But Zelie is not one to take these kinds of exemptions. In this, Therese will be very much like her. I'd say exactly like her. And it'll take us too far afield, but just mention in passing that after she has that, um, I'm not sure what the medical term is when she coughs up blood. Is there a term for that? Whatever it is. And she does that on Holy Thursday night and then again on Good Friday. And she asks permission to go ahead with the fast and all of her duties. And the superior gives permission. Later, Marie of the Trinity, her novice, would, would call that permission insane. But um, to, in, if you can say this of a saint, to some degree, Therese herself was, so I'll say, uh, to blame for this because she made so little of her own illnesses and she uh, professed herself very able and ready to do, you know, all that the other sisters were doing. Celie is like her in this, or the other way around, actually. All right, so what's happening with Leonie? Let's see how long she's been there at the, uh, she's been there, as I say, just about a month. How is this going? You wanted me to give you news of Leonie. It's no small matter, I assure you, having three children to manage, and she's a contemplative nun, and she has to, um, I mean, they have a school full of children, but she is especially charged with the care of these three, 
or her nieces. Uh, it is a lot of trouble. It is difficult to train children to be virtuous. You, that is uh, Isidore and Celine, are already experiencing it with your little Jean. It's not over. You've only just started. So this is very much the older sister, you know, giving advice to a younger brother. If you think that uh, Celie at times is a little blunt with her brother, read the letters of Elise to Isidore. She's, she's, uh, she's pretty clear in what she says to him. But you know, they needed to do it. If you know uh, Isidore, he was a very strong character, so much so that Therese, as a young girl, was, was scared of him. You know, his powerful voice and um, he was a, he had a very strong character and both sisters would have known that the, he needed to be addressed in this way if they were going to hear, hear him. When I was provincial and in formation, I realized that most people respond well to gentleness, you know, if, uh, kindness and goodness. But there's maybe 2% of people that uh, if you speak so forcefully that if anybody spoke that forcefully to me, I'd be sort of shattered. And then they said, oh, are you, you are saying something. They, they just begin to hear it, but that's a very small percentage of people. Um, Isidore is probably a little bit, not quite at that point, but he's a little further toward that spectrum, on that spectrum. Can we manage 15 minutes more? I know it's early afternoon. Do we need a stretch break? Sometimes when we have an hour, we take a three minute. Can we, can we do it? <laughs> What comes to mind when I say that is, um, I remember reading in one of uh, Frank Sheed's books, Marvelous Writer, and um, he quotes, uh, there was a big Eucharistic, um, what do you call it, uh, convention, conference, whatever the word is, in, uh, in Ireland, with several hundred thousand people gathered, and they were approaching the final mass. And a, a busload of pilgrims was driving up to be in part of it, just as the skies looked like they were just about to pour down a deluge. And the this elderly lady gets off the bus and looks up and she says, well, Lord, all I can say is if it rains, you brought it on yourself. <laughs> so you, you brought these 15 minutes on yourself. All right. Uh, let's see. Human beings are nothing, uh, so you need a great, you will need a great deal of patience to reach your goal. But above all, put your trust in God. That's the key. Human beings are nothing but instruments God wants to use, and they must recognize their limitations, make an effort as if everything depended on them, and yet only expect their success is to come from God. And I assure you that by acting in this way, the Lord pours out his blessings and everything goes wonderfully. Can you feel the difference between this letter and those of uh, Zeli? Zeli, it's sharing family news and her heart is right there. And uh, Elise is very much the older sister uh, giving advice that her younger brother needs to hear. As I said earlier, she was considered the saint in the family, a figure of wisdom. Um, I have proof in my Leonie. As you know, this poor child, there's the poor uh, Leonie, had a, has a, had a good many faults. During the first month, I scolded her when she didn't do things right, and that happened so frequently that I hardly did anything else. Leonie never responded well to harshness. Um, she never responded well to it, and she always responded well to, gen to gentleness as uh, uh, Elise discovers here. And there's a piece missing here, parentheses, especially since her sisters kept coming and accusing her, I could see very well that I would make this little girl unhappy without ex And that's what I didn't want. I wanted to be an example of God's providence to her. So I implored God to help and enlighten me because I only had good intentions. And she changes the way she's dealing with Leonie now. I began, therefore, to treat her more gently by avoiding any scolding and by telling her that I saw she wanted to be good and please me, that I had confidence in her. This produced a magic effect that was not only immediate but also lasting because it is continuing and I find her entirely sweet. And so she, she puts into words the other side of Leonie that we've mentioned a number of times, this 
warm, affectionate heart that wants to receive and give love. I find her entirely sweet. I am more pleased with her than with her sisters, which is probably the first time that's ever been said in Leonie's life. She's always the last one. What is unimaginable is the desire she has to please me. It makes her overcome her laziness. She is studying well now. She comes to me candidly to tell me what she has done wrong. I told her I wanted to do so, and she is very obedient. First time any of this has ever been said about Leonie. And this is the one whom we thought was heartless. And note what she says here, and who does in fact love more than the others. I hope God will bless our efforts and that she will become very good because there is still work to do and we will still more than once need to season our gentleness with firmness. Will this last? Well, we'll, we'll find out in the next letters. So we have a, a, a second letter here. So this is written sometime in later February or in March, so probably a few weeks later. I can only say one, okay, this is uh, Elise writing to Zeli this time. I can only say one thing. Leonie does give me trouble, it's true, but no more than Marie did. She has uh, faults, but she has many qualities as well. She has such a good heart, which is what everyone always saw in Leonie, and is very obedient. She never answers back, no matter what we say to her, unlike her two sisters, who always want to be in the right. But her biggest fault is that she doesn't understand, no more than if she were a child of three. So she was very, um, well, to be kind, very slow in, in her studies. And you have one comment somewhere in one of the letters where um, when they're trying to teach the math and there's a test, she just puts down any old number. She doesn't know what to write. And so just anything, you know, that, that she puts down. All right, and then not long after that letter, this time uh, Elise writing to Isidore and his wife. My dear brother and sister, my dear sister, I am expecting Zeli tomorrow. It won't be a joyous visit, I assure you. She must fetch her Leonie. So this one didn't last very long either. What can we do with this poor Leonie? No one knows. What a cross. How I pity my poor dear sister, how I would like to be able to help her, but I can't do anything, nothing at all. And this, this is very hard for Zeli because her last hope was her sister and the visitation. And now for a second time, this has proven um, impossible. However, I hope in the Lord, yes, and with all my strength, I have so much faith in him. I do not distrust him in the least. In fact, Elise, so Sister Marie Docite, if we want to give her uh, her name, she said of Leonie that Leonie would one day be a visitation sister. And Leonie never forgot that. Um, and she'll quote that much later in life when she is a visitation sister. She also knew that it was the novena that Sister Marie Docite prayed for her when she was 18 months old that was in Zeli's firm conviction, the reason why she survived that serious illness. Uh, so she, she, she'll always have a great love for, for this aunt. All right, the, she starts the letter on the 5th of April and she's writing further five days later, Friday the 10th. I saw Zeli and she, she was very resigned. She thinks that when children are not like others, it is the parent's duty to have the bother of looking after them. But in the meantime, she doesn't know what to do. She is going to keep her, her pain is great. She was so confident that the gentleness and love of the visitation convent would change her daughter. And now this hope has vanished. I hope God will come to her aid. And all this time the maid is doing what the maid is doing. And Zeli has no knowledge of this. Let's see where we are time-wise here. Uh, let's see, yeah, let's just do this one. All right, this is two months later. Now again, Zeli is writing to um, her sister-in-law about Leonie here. I know you've learned from her aunt in Le Mans of my poor, that's uh, la pauvre Leonie, 
my poor Leonie's departure from the boarding school. And they would make no further attempts after the second. Uh, what is remarkable is that when the family moves to Lisieux after the death of Zelie, there is, the Benedictine sisters in Lisieux have a, a boarding school for girls. And um, Zelie goes to it and she loves it. And she spends four years there as a boarder. And she always attributed this to the prayers of her mother because this happened shortly after her mother's death. And she always understood that this was a grace that her mother had obtained for her. And actually, she, she loved it so much that the other sisters used to tease her about it. There's a dramatic change that will take place, but there are other things have to happen yet before that does. As you can imagine, this upsets me greatly. That doesn't say it enough. This has caused me profound sorrow, which still continues. My sister was my only hope to reform this child and I was convinced that they would keep her. But it wasn't possible in spite of their best goodwill, or else they would have had to separate her from the other children. She was too disruptive. As soon as she found herself in their company, she couldn't control herself and displayed a lack of discipline without equal. Finally, I believe that only a miracle could change her nature. It's true I don't deserve a miracle, and yet, I hope against all hope. She never did lose that hope. The more I see her being difficult, the more I convince myself that God will not permit her to remain that way. I'll pray so much that he'll let himself be swayed. And I think you have to say that uh, he did let himself be swayed, not in the time or way that Zelie would have foreseen, but with an end result that Zelie from heaven could only the light in, you know, very deeply. Sometimes I think about that. In all of these letters, you see them all longing for the time when they'll all be together in heaven. And they are. That, that time has come. The more I see her being difficult, the more I convince myself that God will not permit her to remain that way. I'll pray so much that he'll let himself be swayed. At the age of 18 months, she was cured of an illness that could have killed her. Why would God have saved her from death and not plan to show her mercy? And it's not in the letters here, but uh, when the time comes that her sister is close to death, Zelie meets with her uh, for a final time. And um, she gives her some commissions to say to the Blessed Mother. And, and um, one of them is, um, why did you let my child be healed, that's that novena at 18 months, if you're not going to make her a saint. And does, uh, Elise doesn't think that it's really pro proper to speak to Mary that way. And so she kind of scolds uh, Zelie. But Zelie writes to her, her sister-in-law says, you know, I, I, I'm not at all ashamed of that. You know, I, that, that's what I wanted to say. All right, let's see where we are. I think we can finish this. Um, I would have liked to take her on the pilgrimage to Parele Monial. So that's um, Margaret Mary Alacoque, which leaves on June 25th, because it was through the intercession of Blessed Margaret Mary that she was cured before, but I can't go away at that time. On the other hand, I'm intending to take her every year to Notre Dame de Sayes, which is a Marian shrine close to Alençon on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. I would lose my mind over it. If that's the only thing, you know, and there weren't some consolations elsewhere, she says, I would lose my mind over this. But thank God I'm consoled by other things. Marie and Pauline are as well as possible. Celine and Therese show a lot of promise. There's only one thing that worries me about Celine. She's terribly thin. She is growing a lot. I'm always afraid she'll be become like my little Helene. As for my big Therese, it's not the same. I never had such a strong child, except for the first. She seems very intelligent, and she was. She had, by any standard, uh, a very uh, um, high level of intelligence. I'm very happy to have her. So she is back now. I think she's back now. I have to look at that. I think so at this point. And I think she'll be the last. She, and she was. She'll be beautiful. She's already graceful. I love her little mouth, which the wet nurse used to tell me was as big as an eye. 
I hug you with all my heart as well as my brother, your affectionate sister. Okay, we'll we'll stop there then uh, for this Father, afternoon. Father Gallagher, before we conclude, this will be the last opportunity. I'm standing over here by uh, the webinar audience can't see me, but this is the angle in which they'll see you. Uh, does this work, Katie? And um, this is the last opportunity they'll have to ask you maybe a couple questions. And we thought you might, everyone here in the retreat group, be interested in, in hearing what uh, others outside this building and this experience here uh, would like to ask you. So if you would that be all right, Father Gallagher? Uh, my only concern is that everybody's been sitting here for an hour. I think people need a, a stretch and so on. If they do have, would a you like of to hear what they, do? You, would you like? Yeah. Okay. You brought it on solidarity. Yourself. <laughs> solidarity. Okay, uh, and we'll have Diane Corlett ask the questions. Uh, the first question is uh, from an anonymous attendee, and they ask you: Can Father Gallagher share an experience? of an answered prayer through the intercession of Leone or the intercession of St. Therese or another member of the family. There were so many answered prayers that uh, flooded into in letters back to the Carmel once Therese became known that they actually started a publication which in French was entitled A Shower of Roses. And there are endless, 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 um, really countless numbers of people who have written in. And I don't know how long they continued that for a number of years, at least. I'm not sure if it's still functioning. So there, there are more um, answered prayers with regard to Therese than we could ever possibly, um, you know, uh, describe. And for Leonie, Leonie, I'll just quote again what I said, I think at some point here that, um, the curator of the house in Alençon uh, was speaking about Leonie, and he said, uh, we have not only the faith that God hears prayers that are made through her intercession, but we have the experience of it. We have person after person after person in great numbers uh, sharing with us prayers that have been answered through the intercession of Leonie. So I'll, I'll answer in that global way. The answer is that there are so many that um, we could never describe them. You know, for some saints, it, it, takes, some, it takes some time before a miracle is, ta um, takes place and is approved with Therese. The problem was that there were so many of them. You know, there, there were just great numbers of them, you know, from which to choose. Pray, pray to these, for, to these uh, saints for their intercession. And like so many others, you won't be disappointed. I'll, I'll just share one, one thing. It's um, when my dad died, my mom told me later that uh, she asked of Therese a sign that he had gone directly to heaven. And uh, she asked for a rose. And the next morning, I don't remember how it happened, but a white rose showed up. A rose showed up at the house. Maybe somebody gave it to her. I'm not sure how it happened. And for her, she was firmly convinced that that was Therese. And you know, just as I mentioned that, you, you can't count the numbers of stories. It really is a shower of roses. Okay, the second question is again from an anonymous attendee. And they are asking, what led you to so deeply study the Martine family? And what, pr what prompted you to share these insights with others? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, like so many others, as I said, when we began, Therese became part of my story early on, you know, even before seminary, when I read the story of a soul and just like so many others, just really felt drawn to her. And then she sort of faded as the years of theology and priesthood went along. And then uh, what happened, I think I mentioned this too, that I was listening to a talk on Therese, where the, the speaker uh, analyze, so to speak, her, her the, the different ways she speaks of prayer. And that really caught my attention. And Chris, I don't remember when you and I spoke about the idea of doing a series of podcasts. It must have been at some point as I was getting into this reading. And once we talked about it, that firmed it up and gave me the, the added incentive to start doing uh, wide reading in all of this. And then, uh, Chris, you're the one that led to the series on Leonie. 
just by remarking, as I said, as we were doing this, it would be interesting to see something done on Leonie. And so I followed up on it. It's uh, so it, to some degree, it was uh, in service of the podcasts, but it was also very much for me. I'll just say that as I was uh, going through Therese and her writings, uh, a sense really developed in me of uh, Therese as my sister. And she had a special love for priests. I mean, she's there for everyone, but she always had a special love for priests. And that came alive for me. And uh, I began to pray to her, you know, in a, in a different way at that time. You've been viewing Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download audio recordings from this retreat and so much more from Father Gallagher, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find them in the free Discerning Hearts app. You can also view other teachings conducted by Father Gallagher by checking out the various playlists listed below. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer rock-solid and authentic spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about Discerning Hearts and join us next time for Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher.